to be very exciting. We're here for 40 minutes to talk about the Russian ecosystem and how Russian companies can go global <laughs> with the help of Russian investors or investors from elsewhere. So in, in, instead of doing um, lengthy slides to introduce these fellows to my left, um, they're each going to introduce themselves to you in one to three sentences. Uh, thank you. I'm Dmitry Chikhachov. I'm a managing partner of Runa Capital. Uh, my partner, Sergey Belousov, just introduced Runa Capital. That makes my life much easier. Uh, I can tell that we invest in uh, software development companies where most value is created through development of software. Uh, we invest not only in Russia and Ukraine. It's only about half of our portfolio is in Russia and Ukraine and in Eastern Europe. But we do invest in Western Europe, in the United States, in Asia. Uh, and the main uh, mission of Runa Capital, we help uh, talented technology teams to build global businesses. So one important feature of most of our investments, they aim to be market leaders in global level. Thank you. Uh, my name is Igor Tabor. I'm part of Intel Capital. Uh, Intel Capital is the global uh, venture capital investment organization investing on a range of 400 to 500 million dollars a year. Uh, we've invested in about 50 countries around the world, uh, investing in all different segments of technology from a consumer internet, e-commerce, gaming, etc., to enterprise software, consumer software, mobility, and uh, digital media and, and, and other segments. So very wide focus. I'm Pasha Bogdanov. I'm with Almaz Capital. Uh, we invest in the company in companies with ties to the former Soviet Union. We have an uh, office in Silicon Valley. We have an office in Moscow. We try to actively help our companies. Companies say we're quite good at that to, to grow uh, globally as well as to grow in, in the region. Uh, my name is Leonid Boguslavsky. I'm a founder of uh, investment company uh, Runet. Um, we are doing uh, investments uh, since uh, 1999. Uh, we invested uh, about uh, 300 million dollars so far um, in uh, more than 40 companies uh, which are located um, in about 20 countries. Uh, that's who we are. Great. So two to three years ago there were fewer than 20 funds in Russia. And since then, funds have been springing up like mushrooms. There's Frontier Ventures, Foresight Ventures, Runa Capital. It seems like there are more every month. What specifically spurred this activity? Who was responsible for that? I think it's the exits, like Yandex and Mail.ru IPO. Sorry, can you speak a little bit louder? Louder than that? OK. So major exits, like IPOs of Yandex and Mail.ru, has demonst have demonstrated that you can make lots of money in Russia, investing in technology. That was clearly a driver for, for new funds to, to crop, as well as for other global funds to start looking actively at Russia. Uh, on the other hand, we also see a growth of good investment opportunities as people who got trained in, in Yandex and Mail, uh, got trained in engineering centers, research centers for global corporations, start their own businesses in Russia. More and more uh, activity of that kind is happening. Uh, companies like Parallels and Acronis uh, gave birth to other companies, people uh, go and start other businesses, that, that people who learn how to grow global successful businesses. So all that activity is driving the interest and all the money that flows into, into the region. Well, actually, I think that Greece is responsible for all of that because now venture firm or venture investment becomes less risky than sovereign bonds. So why not? Yeah, I, I think part of it is, um, is the recycled capital. Uh, me? I didn't say anything yet. No. You have to disagree. Part, part of it is the recycled capital that, that Pasha mentioned, but I think the other part is that, you know, I think capital is finding itself, you know, technology is the area which is now probably the next frontier uh, where the capital can be put to a, to a good use. I think historically in Russia, the other areas where the capital have been invested uh, are now are not producing returns. Uh, that a commensurate with the risk, and so capital is finding itself in kind of the next next frontier. Uh, in one sentence, uh, you know, investors just uh, recognize that uh, Russia is a large market, and uh, of course, uh, certain successes which already happened 
just uh, pushed the interest uh, to Russia. And of all the new funds, 50 or so funds currently functioning out of Russia, which, which are trustworthy? I mean, how does a fund establish itself as um, prestigious with, within the Russian ecosystem? How did we establish as prestigious? Or, well, uh, that's a good question. I mean, each, 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 each fund uh, is doing a lot of PR. And uh, I mean, it's always a question which is uh, asked by startups. I mean, how do I identify a good investor? Actually, which fund is better? Or where, where is the best uh, investor? Uh, and the, the answer is pretty simple, uh, in my opinion. If you as a startup have to choose an investor, you have to do the same thing as investor is doing when selects a startup for investment. Do some due diligence. Just find out who is behind this fund as uh, limited partners. What kind of money is in this fund? This is important. Who is the team of the fund? What is their track record? Did they build any successful businesses before? Uh, and that also gives you important understanding of uh, is it a good investor or not. Uh, talk to their portfolio companies, actually, how they're getting along with this uh, fund, with this investor. Uh, so uh, three simple things to help you to understand who is actually a good investor and who is not. And it's not about prestige. It's about uh, real things, real background. Yeah, I, I think Russia is no different than U.S. or any other markets. In U.S., 9 out of 10 funds are going to fail. In Russia, probably going to be the same thing. 9 out of 10 funds that you name mentioned are going to be fail. They're going to fail. We just don't know which 9. Uh, and I think the only way to measure success is by the track record. And so all the entrepreneur has to do is to look at the, either a fund track record or the individuals behind the fund track record. And that's really the only thing that distinguishes good funds from the bad funds. I, I want to disagree. So. Uh, I, I don't think we have actually 50 funds. I think funds that can write several million dollar checks are presented on this stage. Maybe there's one or two more. But that's pretty much it in terms of funds. There are different investment vehicles that can invest, like private money, absolutely, but not funds. So, it's, so far, it's not very hard to stand out because there are really few funds. I think that uh, entrepreneurs uh, who are looking for investors, they, um, they should look, and they are actually looking for two things. Either it's uh, uh, international experience, which means that investor could uh, share with them uh, experience with the same type of business on a different markets and even uh, make uh, certain important introductions so that these guys could talk to their colleagues in other countries. This is one thing. And another available uh, criteria for uh, any entrepreneur should be if uh, he see um, that he that from the investor he will be dealing also with the experienced entrepreneur who had this uh, in his background before so that he can learn a lot of uh, things and avoid mistakes if you're if you as an entrepreneur if your ambition is to go global is there any benefit to working with investors outside of the country or could you do that within the russian ecosystem I don't think it's a distinction. I don't think that's the right way to distinguish the investors inside the country, outside the country. I don't even know what, what that means. I think you know, we're all, all, we're all everywhere. I think more importantly, you have to look at the individual partner that you would be working with at a particular fund, uh, individual partners, relationship, network, track record, like I mentioned, ability. So I don't think it's Russian or not Russian. I don't think that's the right distinction. I think it's a specific person you'll be working with. Yeah, well, I, I agree with uh, Igor. Well, we promised to give a fight here, but I have to agree with Igor. <laughs> the nationality of the fund is not relevant. The relevant thing is uh, whether this fund can help you go into a global market. And, uh, well, I dare say that some U.S. funds may be less helpful than some of the funds sitting here. That's probably would be true. Uh, so w what you have to look at is rather uh, what kind of problems you have in front of you going to global markets. And there is a bunch of problems, starting from building a good product uh, would, that would be competitive on global level, uh, then uh, having a good business plan for markets you address, having the right partners for markets you address, building operations in the markets you're going to penetrate and where you're going to uh, operate, 
uh, finding uh, more fi financing for going global because that always requires more financing. So these things, these problems, you have to solve with the help of your investor. So this is how you choose it, and not by the country or president. But uh, I agree that natural in instinct for, for an entrepreneur to look for the fund in the market that tries to penetrate. Uh, that's why uh, we at Almaz have an office in Silicon Valley. Our U.S. partners have been investing as VCs in the U.S. since 1990s. Tons of years of experience, lots of contacts. We provide as much value as any other fund on the, on the Sand Hill Road, maybe with exception of the top, top few. So uh, we, we, you have to look at the team composition, to look at their contacts, and whether they will help your particular idea to, to grow in the market you target. Yeah, I also think that uh, the nationality of the fund uh, doesn't matter much. Uh, what matters is uh, w with whom this company will be dealing, who will be the person from the fund or people from the fund who will be dealing with the company, and to what extent they can provide value to the company. And that's the only criteria. And it could be a local fund, it could be international fund, even more sometimes, uh, and I, I see this uh, uh, from time to time, international fund doesn't provide value at all. And local fund is providing a hell of value. So along with the development of these new domestic Russian funds, Western funds have also began to take more interest in Russian internet space, um, including Intel Capital, um, who made the first investment in, in, was an early investor in Yandex in 2002, and Mangrove. Um, Esther Dyson also has 15 investments in Russia, as I understand. Um, what, what is the impression of a foreign investor on Russia right now? How do you believe a Western investor views the, the Russian space? Why don't you ask Brian Feinstein about that? So how, how do we know what is the impression of uh, foreign investors on, on the Russian market? What's your advantage? Uh, well, we have a number of advantages. Uh, I mean, I, we just discussed that that important thing is not whether this is a foreign fund coming to Russia or a Russian fund uh, uh, coming to other countries, because we do investments outside Russia. We did investments in the United States, we did investments in uh, UK, in France, in Southeast Asia, we have one investment in Singapore. So wh why US companies actually prefer investment of Runa Capital to that of uh, Bessemer? Because we have better fit in terms of technology and in better uh, fit in terms of what kind of problems we can help to solve to those people, rather than uh, locally, uh, local funds. So I, th I think the, the, there should not be any special impression of, of Russia for Bessemer and other guys. Yeah, I, I think typical Western VC, or the, you know, if you take an average top tier VC in Silicon Valley, I think they've gone, some of them, most of them have been at least thinking about Russia, or heard about it, or talked to people about it for, for some time. And they've gone through, I think, a range of uh, thoughts on it. Uh, first thing that kind of drove their interest in Russia is the fact that their ability to, ex to generate returns uh, Drew Goff showed some data yesterday, right? So they all went to China and India because they couldn't generate returns in U.S. Now they can generate returns in China and India because it's over competitive, over capitalized, valuations are too high, etc. And so they're looking for their next frontier as to where they're going to generate returns. Brazil and Russia are the logical next two uh, that you have to look at. There's, you know, there's not that many options. And so that, that's one. Second one, five years ago, if you would ask anybody in Silicon Valley, would there be a, a billion dollar company in the Russian internet? They would all look at you like you're a crazy person. Uh, and then they, all of a sudden they found out there are two companies and both <laughs> the largest internet companies in Europe uh, happen to be Russians with a multi-billion dollar valuations. And they go, shit, how, how did we miss that? Uh, so I think that's, uh, those two drivers I think got people interested in looking at Russia quite seriously now. Oh. Um, I think that, uh, but it's my my personal opinion, I think that the dynamic is the following. Uh, if we are talking about interest uh, from uh, in international funds to Russia, 
So initially, there was not much of the interest. Then I was. I mean, surely, I mean, like uh, 10 years ago, okay? Then the interest was growing, and I think that uh, the maximum interest was uh, like two years ago, maybe a year ago. What is happening now, I think that this interest a little bit slowing down uh, for Russian investments. Um, and uh, there are certain, uh, not, not so much issues, but... Uh, uh, the, the, the market became uh, more mature and more clear for many uh, investors who have been investing in Russia already for a while in terms of uh, how, they will, uh, uh, how they will get their returns. Uh, and uh, one of the issues certain funds see is that uh, it's not, uh, the exit is not clear for many companies in which they invested. Because uh, they see that these companies, uh, because of what they are doing, uh, very likely will not get to IPO, which means that uh, they can exit only through strategic sale. But then we discussed this before, there is not M&A market in Russia right now. And plus the whole uh, economy issues, uh, plus, uh, unfortunately, uh, image of Russia, which is uh, not uh, going good for, for the last you know, few years. That's all um, concern international funds a little bit. I, uh, if I can also speak to the same topic, uh, I think that the point to differentiate uh, yourself really hard has not yet arrived, actually. Hey, Aster and Van Group are great. They're early stage uh, investors, but that's, that's only two of them actually are active early stage. Nobody else does early stage. Big guys now want to uh, bet on category winners, write, write big checks, etc. They're not competing with us who can go early, mid stage. Uh, but what we see happening, and it's a happening process, when we see big companies start building offices and hiring lots of people, and the building regional offices in Kiev or Novosibirsk, Minsk, uh, then we'll have a lot of competition. Uh, probably, uh, we, if, if it happens, it means that we have done a good job and have shown that we can generate a lot of money in the market, and then we'll have to fight and show that we are better because of our experience and of our local connections. But uh, right now, it's not that much of a competition in, in what we do. Do you all agree with Leonid that um, the Russian market is slowing down even, or maturing? We, we need to uh, define uh, on uh, what size of funds we are considering. Yeah, we are considering guys who are writing checks more than $30 million or something like this, or we're considering uh, uh, early stage investors, and that's different because, uh, like uh, Pasha just mentioned, for the early stage investors, it's less issue than for late stage investors in Russia. It's less an issue for the early stage investors than for the late stage investors because the early stage investor, let's say, investing one million. Uh, could have certain chances to cash out, uh, even being cashed out by the larger fund later on. But the funds which are uh, doing investments at the late stage, uh, they, they have to ask themselves how to exit. Uh, yeah, actually, when we're talking about maturity of the market, uh, a good point uh, to make here is that many investors, uh, especially many foreign investors, when they invest in Russia, or when they say they invest in Russia, they invest in Russian market. So they invest in something that would be consumed in, in Russia by Russians. Uh, we do quite the opposite. We do invest in technology teams that uh, would produce a product uh, that would be consumed outside Russia. Uh, and, and this market, it, it's, I think it's far from maturity. It's just uh, in, in its very early stages because uh, we only see first examples of Russian products uh, getting success or Russian products and Ukrainian products and East European software products 
getting successful uh, on the global level. Uh, so I don't think we can say anything about maturity here. I agree. And you mentioned um, the image of Russia, and I wanted to ask you to clarify that. Is there some prejudice you're referring to on the part of foreign VCs um, that maybe it's not secure business in Russia, or that um, from a legal point of view it would be risky? Well, first of all, again, why we're talking about Russia all the time? I mean, we should talk about Eastern Europe. I mean, let's at least talk about Ukraine. We, we've invested in a company uh, which is based in Zhutomir. Sergey uh, told you about Jelastic, and uh, Jelastic will present soon themselves. Uh, I don't see any special legal or other kind of problems uh, having business in, in, in this part of the world. I, uh, when we're talking about company which produces software here for global market, when we're talking about uh, something for local market, well, this is something different. I, I, can, I can tell that, yes, uh, there are issues for global investors looking at some early stage opportunities. Typically, if somebody sets up something in Ukraine or Russia, small business, he needs to pay large salaries, he pays something uh, from his company, something from offshore account, on some cards, like everybody else does around, like all the stuff which is leg illegal, but everybody does. And then if he comes to the Western VC sitting somewhere in Silicon Valley or in Boston and tells him this is my Russian setup, 30% of salaries are paid legally and then something illegally, people will naturally assume that he just is a, somebody who is not reliable. You cannot invest in him. He is a thief and a fraud. And many, many people will not fund such an entrepreneur. Uh, we see many good companies, good guys starting businesses, operating like that because that's what the people around them, what they do. And we are eager to, you know, to roll our sleeves and help them structure the company that is clean and operates completely compliant and, and legally. And then we position them well for the next fundraising. But there is a, there is a specific to operating in this market. Uh, that uh, makes it hard for some global VCs to fund certain opportunities. Yeah, I, I think this whole thing about you know investors worrying about you know Russian government taking it away, away their business or legal issues. I think this whole thing is over over position. I, I, I think people who are worried about this are the people who are never been to Russia, who maybe read a couple articles in the Wall Street Journal and kind of making their conclusions based on it. I think anybody who has any major VC who has done any serious way of, spent any serious time of looking in the region, travel to the region, that's not the reason why they chose not to invest. Uh, it's more likely reasons like the exit landscape that Leonid mentioned, uh, or other things, you know, but it's not that they're worried that you know, their company will be taken away from them. I, I just don't think that's an issue. The term going global and, and what that means to you in terms of the teams you work with, what are the biggest challenges in getting Central and Eastern European teams to go global? Uh, you know, there's every, um, most panels I've been to, everybody always talks about going global like it's, like it's always a good thing. Uh, it's not always a good thing, and in fact, about probably half of the time, it's not a good thing. I think there's, depending on the market they're in and your target customers, you can, you can build very large business by not going global. Yandex is an example of that, right? Uh, and I think depending on the segment that you go to, it would actually be a mistake to go global. If you're trying to build a consumer internet company in Russia, you probably should not even think about going global until you got, figure out how you, make, how you build a big company on a 60 million internet users that, that exist locally. Uh, now, for some companies, uh, like enterprise software companies, they probably do have to think about going global, uh, but only at some point of their time. I, I, I think the only asset that startup has is focus and focusing on the right thing and on the right problem. Trying to do too many things in, 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 too early can pretty much kill you. Uh, I, I think there could be several challenges uh, that startups face when they go global. Uh, and I can just give two examples uh, out of our portfolio companies. One company is Nginx. This is a web server. I think 
Many people here know what is Nginx. Who knows? Okay, some technical people here. Okay, it's 12% uh, market share on global level. So it's a very popular web server, used by Facebook, used by WordPress, used by Amazon, as we recently understood. So already kind of global. But the challenge here is actually to build a commercial product that would be competitive on global level because what Nginx is doing now, it's uh, open source software, uh, which is something different from, from a commercial product. And to build good commercial product, a startup needs to establish a uh, very disciplined and uh, quite sophisticated engineering process inside itself, which is sometimes difficult. And in many cases, people just don't know how to do that. Uh, because engineering process within a software development is similar to engineering process in automotive industry. It's not so obvious, but in fact it is so. Uh, so that could be a big challenge to, to overcome. Uh, another big challenge, uh, and this, this is a company called Equid, uh, also very popular. It's a widget for e-commerce, uh, 200,000 storefronts, uh, number one e-commerce application on Facebook also kind of global success. The challenge that Equit faced recently was to recruit a senior executive in the US, someone who would drive their sales through channel uh, in US market. So recruiting people overseas, that could also be a huge challenge. Finding right partners could be a challenge. So it depends on your business model. It depends on the state of the art of technology you have. I, I don't think there is a single recipe here. It's a, it's a variety of things could be a problem. Um, yeah, I think that it's uh, very much depends on a business model and there are certain uh, business models for for which it's uh, very difficult to go globally or first of all, I would not use the uh, word globally. I would use word internationally. So to become international company. Uh, for example, uh, if we are talking about uh, services businesses like, you know, consumer internet and uh, e-commerce and things like that. Um, I think it's very cha challenging, very, very challenging for the company being based in, uh, let's say, Russia or Ukraine to uh, become a real international company. As far as for uh, technology companies, product companies, um, we know examples and it's uh, growing and there are certain successes. Um, and again, depending on the uh, models, even for technology and product companies, uh, many of them then uh, trying to be based, not here, but they are opening their offices in United States or much, not so often in uh, Western Europe. But there are some examples when, uh, but there are very few examples. Uh, no, yeah, I, I was, uh, let me finish. There are a few examples when uh, the companies uh, actually uh, can have, um, can be based in uh, Russia or Ukraine and become international companies. We all know those, you know, few examples. Let's say Kaspersky, Abbey, uh, there are certain others, but there it's not many. And it's very, it's not, uh, not often, but uh, there are certain entrepreneurs who not been saying that, no, no, I have nothing to do with Russia because there are also some, uh, some entrepreneurs who are moving to US and then trying to show to the market that they don't have uh, connections with Russia uh, or Ukraine. But some of them uh, um, done a pretty good job. So we, for example, uh, Stepan Pachikov with the Evernote, but that's not the Russian or Ukrainian or Eastern European company. It's a U.S. company. And Stepan is based in U.S., even often visiting this part of the world. And, and in my opinion, the, the hardest part uh, going international is to be able to operate uh, a company with has major components of the company in two locations very far away from each, from each other. Like if you compare Silicon Valley to Moscow, it's 11 hour time difference. So uh, if you have a management team in Silicon Valley and technology team in Russia or in Ukraine, there's a large time difference. 
usually uh, founders are technologists. Uh, you try to recruit management or sales guys in the US and having them collaborate successfully, uh, having them bridge the cultural differences, the time differences, so that they work as a team is pretty hard. Uh, I would provide uh, maybe one story. Uh, actually, when I started uh, my business, uh, IT service, IT consulting business, uh, system integration business in the uh, beginning of 90s, I was dreaming to bring company to be international. And, um, and then I recognized that uh, for such kind of businesses, it's uh, impossible. I mean, for if the company is based uh, as a headquarter in Russia or Ukraine as a system integration or IT consulting company, uh, it's about impossible. I'm not saying 100% impossible, but it's about impossible. And there was a very good uh, lesson I learned. Um, we've been about to get a, a pretty good project to, for implementation uh, in Canada. And the uh, chief of informational officer of the company wanted us our company because he saw resources, he, he saw the uh, technicians which we have and consultants. He wanted us to win the, the project and to, to implement what they need. But when he came to the CEO and also to the board, they said, are you kidding? If we, if you would hire, if, if we, if we would hire the Indian company, there will be no issue if the project will fail. But if we will f hire the Russian company and the project will fail, the board will tell, are you crazy? Why you hired Russians? No special reactions. I think it's, uh, uh, we, we, we are talking now about uh, frontiers a lot and about countries and about uh, different things. But I just want to say that uh, software business is uh, getting international and internet was created as a space without frontiers and I think talking about states and frontiers and nationalities here it's a little bit artificial uh, we should talk about talent and top schools which produce talent because essentially what is needed to, to uh, produce software and to create uh, technology business is talent and I think in this part of the world we have good supply of talent we have we inherited very good technical uh, education from Soviet Union, both Russia, Ukraine, other East European countries, they also benefited from, from the system to build good education system. And that gives us an edge in, in uh, this global competition in, in technology sector. And uh, we are lagging behind a little bit, but just because we started late. I mean, the business in this country started 20 years ago. The civilized business started 10 years ago. Technology business started maybe three to five years ago. So we are in a very early childhood. Why we're talking about some weird things like uh, frontiers and everything? Well, I, I want to actually somewhat agree with Leonid. I, I think uh, everybody uh, of, who invested in the companies that sell to the US market here, as well as entrepreneurs who build US companies, they do not go and say made in Russia proudly to their clients and partners. They do not emphasize that they are Russia supported. Because yes, there is still prejudice against Russian. They, they, they operate as US companies, they have US management, they look native and it makes much easier, for much easier communication and sales experience. And uh, I think that's the case, actually, if you look at the Western companies coming to Russia or Ukraine, they also hire local managers who speak the language. They try to, you know, uh, go local as well. I, I don't think it's such a big deal. Uh, I just can give an example. I mean, uh, everybody in this audience know Japanese cars like Toyota or like Mazda. Are these good cars? Toyota Land Cruiser, not, not really a piece of... Something. Yeah, it's a good car. Uh, just 40 years ago, Japanese automotive industry was far behind U.S. automotive industry. Now Toyota is beating uh, General Motors and other U.S. producers on their like uh, home terrain, and uh, that happened just in 40 years. And that happened in a very uh, in an industry with a lot of uh, inertia. Actually, it's it's pretty heavy. 
in internet things change faster and i believe like why everybody is talking about us next billion internet users will, will not appear in us it will appear in asia and uh, we are de facto somehow part of asia so why don't we look at these new opportunities in asian market and uh, of course at this moment us is like 35 to 40 percent of global software and internet market that's why everyone who wants to sell software uh, first of all thinks about us market and i mean uh, if you go to Rome, look as Romans do, right? So that's probably one reason why everybody wants to be US-like. Uh, <clears throat> I think I mentioned it on the earlier panel I was on. We looked at our portfolio and we looked at our enterprise software companies in our portfolio. And we found out, and they're all US, most of them are US-based companies. And we found out that one in four of our portfolio companies have engineering teams in this part of the world. Uh, you'd never know by looking at their website, you'd never know, and they would never admit it easily by talking to a management team, et cetera. But the point is, I think, I think a lot of companies are starting to recognize about the talent uh, that there is, you know, Toyotas uh, made out of, you know, that can be, that can, can be made in, in Russia. We're unfortunately out of time. You can meet with any of these speakers in the TA Venture lounge directly after this. They'll all be there for 15 minutes, so please approach them with your questions. I'm sure they're happy to answer. Um, and thanks, everyone, for your time. Okay.